So I'm just going to ask one of them as, again, uh, your questions are collected and sorted and uh, the cream rises to the top. My friend wonders, Wendell, about your reaction to this new wave of interest in the work that you have been doing for so long. Your reaction to the growth of community-supported agriculture, organic and local food, the slow food movement, the nascent slow money movement. After so many years of calling for this kind of change through all your many voices, <laughs> what is your response to where we are at the moment with all of this energy now flowing into these ideas? Well, of course, I'm immensely grateful. Um, not too many years ago, I didn't imagine that, that I would ever see this happen. In fact, uh, there was a, a year not too long ago, 10 or 15 years, when I was saying to myself, well, you know, uh, there's not going to be any good result. You're just going to have to go on uh, uh, with your with the support of your few friends, you know, and, and finish it out this way. And uh, then in a year or two, I realized that, that uh, things were going on all over the country. So uh, a rare thing for me, I decided I'd go around and, and um, on a speaking trip and kind of uh, encourage people and thank them a little bit. But, um, this uh, uh, bunch of new people, mostly new people, not all of them, who are um, serving the farmers' markets, and this is maybe I'd better take that back. I don't really know whether they're all new people or not. Some of them are. Uh, the farmers' markets, the community-supported agriculture farms, and most significantly, I think this growth of a kind of an agrarian awareness in the in the cities of some kind of duty to those proxies they've given to other people to raise food for them. And so I'm just immensely grateful to have lasted long enough to see this. Um, but I, at the same time that, that we feel a kind of relief and excitement about this, I think we have to check ourselves and realize what immense jobs of work we have lying ahead of us and how very hard we're going to have to work to keep our minds clear and our bodies capable to carry this on to some kind of significant conclusion. Uh, the other side is <laughs> just beginning to pay to notice us. But that's, we've, we've, we've been a little dog yapping at the heels of a, of a giant with a big club. <laughs> and um, uh, we still are. I had the idea, and I'm going to say it uh, with some some uh, suspicion that it might not be true, but I think that national animal identification uh, business was um, maybe the first effort uh, uh, of big agriculture, of agribusiness, to use their friends in government to strike a, a meaningful blow against the small producers. I think there's going to be more than that. As the farmers markets and the CSAs and so on begin to take market share, uh, we're going to hear from those people. And uh, they are not going to be the benign uh, family folk that they've represented themselves to be. After all, I, I come from Kentucky. And uh, I know uh, what the corporations are capable of. And if you'd like to know, uh, have a look at the mountaintop removal sites in Kentucky and West Virginia. These are people who will do anything. And we mustn't be optimistic about their character.
The other, other thing is that they're working against themselves. That's on our side. They've, and to that extent, to the extent that their failure is obvious to everybody and undeniable by them, they're working for us. Now the surprise. I was going to say, now I didn't we're even both going to be surprised. Well, here's one. This is a good one because uh, I was wanting to ask this myself. <laughs> <laughs> and now I don't have to lie. I, I can, you know, I can make up questions here. No, one <laughs> no. Um, oh, power! Don't let it go to your head. <laughs> huh? <laughs> um. As many of you in the audience know, um, another of the connections that Wendell Berry has to Madison, Wisconsin, comes through his teacher, Wallace Stegner. And I know that we have a lot of uh, Stegner fans in this audience because I have I've worked a bit myself on Stegner. So the question is simply, could you tell us what influence Wallace Stegner had on your work, has had on your work? <laughs> well, I, to... to um answer that question, I have to be more autobiographical than I really want to be. <laughs> but uh, in, in 1958, okay. I went to Stanford on what is known as a Stegner Fellowship, $2,500 in those days. And um, at the time, I had no idea um, what my life was. I was in a curious way, although I had, I had Tanya, and we had Mary, our first child. Um, in some sense, I was still living outside my life, what had been my life at the start and what was going to be my life later, and I hope at the end. Uh, I thought I was really a very ambitious young fellow. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a writer just desperately. And I thought that to be a writer, I would probably have to be a kind of a university bum. Um, <laughs> going around teaching creative writing or some such at at universities, and I, uh, what delivered me from that, ironically, was an, <laughs> an invitation eventually to come back to Kentucky and teach creative writing at the University of Kentucky. <laughs> well, anyway, when I, in, in, when I went to Stanford in 1958, I'd never been west. Uh, I had, uh, had learned surprisingly little as a student. Um, I knew more than I knew I knew about my place and about animals and the things I'd learned at work. Um, but I'd, I had no idea that I would be, become anything but what I just described to you. And um, so Wallace Stegner at that time uh, impressed himself upon me simply as an, as an extraordinarily impressive, attractive man. Uh, um, a, a man of considerable humanity and kindness, also reserve. And he had a way of uh, uh, what would you say, emitting a kind of aura about himself. And if you got into that and you weren't working as hard as you could, you felt embarrassed. <laughs> you knew he was working as hard as he could. And then, uh, actually not altogether to his satisfaction, I did get invited back to Kentucky. And the next thing Tanya and I did was buy this little old place, uh, hillside on the Kentucky River that I'd known all my life and she very kindly permitted me to return to and live in. And uh, we thought, well, this will be our weekend 
place. You see how, how extraordinarily uh, original I was. <laughs> I was going to teach in the university and have a weekend place in the country. <laughs> and uh, so with some, the old house was all to pieces. Uh, the, the, there was a corner in the kitchen. The foundation rolled under it both ways, and the corner had opened up, and the people who lived there before us had just nailed fly screen over the hole. <laughs> so we began this, uh, we sort of put our hands to the work with uh, some dear friends that we knew in, in uh, Port Royal uh, to, to this house to make it better, to save it. And in the course of that, I don't know which one of us understood it first. I, well, it, I might as well say Tanya understood it first because she always understands everything first. <laughs> um, it suddenly came upon us, and I can remember where we were standing when this bolt hit us. Uh, we were, we're not fixing up a weekend place. We're fixing a place where we're going to live. And uh, that I would uh, settle for that and, uh, in, in Kentucky really, um, I think, was a surprise to Mr. Stegner. <laughs> and um, uh, at the same time, I began to be really influenced by Mr. Stegner because about that time, Wolf Willow was published. And um, I, that book, that is a wonderful book, and it has a perfectly crystalline novella at the end of it. Um, but that was about um, Wallace Stegner's pilgrimage to the place of his birth, which of course was a frontier place and a western place. And with that book, I began to understand him as a writer, and as far as I still know, the first writer who had looked upon his place, his region, not just as material, but as a responsibility that he would have to work for and protect. And uh, so, you know, as he, as I understood and lived into that influence, from him, it grew into an immensity and will always be with me. Well, we'll, we'll weave these threads. I'm going to follow up with another bit of autobiographical questioning, if you stuff. don't mind. <laughs> Stegner went west himself at the end, around the end of World War II. And so this very simple question, maybe it has a simple answer, is where were you in 1944 or 45 at the time your story was set? I was at home. I was in, in, uh, in Henry County, um, where in an odd way, and I think this would be true of any uh, place probably in the country at that time, the war had just been inescapable. I had an uncle uh, who was in the Navy. He was the only member of my family who was in the, in the war. Um, but he was in it uh, with the uh, craziest luck. He had gone to uh, the, the Ag School at the University of Kentucky for a few semesters, and that was on his record. And so they needed a big garden at Pearl Harbor to feed the hospital. And um, my uncle was put in charge of that garden. And uh, uh, we, he had a lot to learn. It's, it was funny to hear him talk about it. But he learned a lot from an old Chinaman named Pan Chu Young. And his stories about all that were, were great. But that's where he was stuck. But also, uh, he was stuck in another way because he had to do hospital duty, even though uh, he was distracted by that garden and his chief uh, effort to learn things. So it was an extraordinarily difficult thing to straddle from the garden to the hospital all through that, all through that war. So anyway, we, 
uh, young people were always conscious of the war because of, of our neighbors and kinfolk who were in it, uh, because of tragedies coming back from it to rest at home. And um, so it was never very far from our minds. And of course, we played uh, war games, we boys, at school. We had a game in my, my room. Uh, we, we boys played a, a game called Japs and Americans. And uh, I can't remember that it had rules or anything, but anyway, it was, <laughs> it was the way we um, acted out our participation in this terrible, terrible time. I don't, th don't think anybody ever won that particular war. But there was a big, a big uh, sort of, um, um, not, a, uh, not a bulletin board, a kind of a great sign in the courthouse yard with, with all the names of all the people in Henry County, it's a small little county, all the names of the people who were in the service on that board. And we would stand and look at it and find our relatives' names, you know. And then when uh, one of them got killed, there'd be a gold star that would go up with that name. And there were service flags in the windows. If you had one boy or two boys, there would be a star for each boy, each son, in the window. And when one of them got killed, it, one of those stars would turn to gold. So it was... You know, we were very fortunate not to be fought back and forth over the top of, but we were also unable ever to forget. And I might mention one other thing. We were very proud, all us boys who talked endlessly about the war, we were very proud of our country in those days because we didn't torture prisoners. encourage you to read the first essay in citizenship papers again if you haven't. Um, I reread it the other night and uh, Wendell speaks to that issue at, uh, at greater length. One of the things that strikes me listening to your story tonight, Wendell, just is how the pacing of it and the language and especially your reading of it embodies exactly what the story is about. The time, the place, the pace. And of course, we live in a different age and different time now, and the pace has changed, and the homecoming that veterans experience now is nothing like what it was in your time. And I say that as an as a, uh, introduction to this question and to make it a little less of an abrupt shift from your time in your story to the question, which is, as an essayist and cultural critic who has written a fair amount about community, and you heard that, of course, in the story, what is your view of newly emerging digital communities, the internet-based communities, et cetera? Are they credible forms of community? If not, why not? Well, you know, we're just flooded with language now, which means that we've got to be careful about language. Now, you can speak of a digital community if you want to, but all I ask is that you recognize that you're using a metaphor. A real community, Aldo Leopold defined a community, it's the people and the place and everything else that's in it. And they're there together and they're interdependent and we're just trying in the most awkward way, like a bunch of, of children, trying to understand the extent of our responsibility toward those other neighbors that are not people we like or that are not human. And uh, this is a, a terribly daunting job of work. The, uh, it's, the work is redeemed by the great interest there is in it. I mean, the great interest that is possibly in it for people who will apply themselves to it. How best to farm or garden so as to 
share the place rather than tyrannize over it and ultimately destroy it? These are, are interesting questions and uh, people, good people have spent their lives on those questions. And if they weren't fascinating questions, they couldn't have done it. Just remember that. Those of you uh, aware of the time know that we're going a little bit over, and I hope that's okay with everybody. It means uh, you may not be able to get as many books signed afterwards, but uh, it's such an opportunity. Let me ask just we one. Did, we just don't want them to stay till we have to feed them. That's <laughs> That's not us. I hope not. <laughs> Maybe they're trying to tell us something. Especially when it's slow food, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will speak loudly. <laughs> Wendell, what are you writing right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I could say that uh, when I'm able, I'm writing sh short stories because they end quicker than novels. <laughs> and now and then a poem for the joy of it. And, uh, but I also uh, have a schedule of dutiful work. And um, much of that is, is of real interest. Um, jobs that I have to do just because I have causes and, and allies. My big mistake was getting a lot of allies and making friends with people. <laughs> I, <laughs> don't do it, young people. Headline, Wendell's advice to young people. <laughs> yeah, don't make, don't make any friends. <laughs> don't fall in love. That is actually pretty good advice, but you won't take it. <laughs> we have, I guess, one more question and then one that's almost a question. So, Wendell, <laughs> when you said you don't like to speak the last word, but if you had to, what would it be? Oh. <laughs> no, I just won't deal in that. I, just, uh, I, I don't trade in that commodity of last words or uh, what would be the thing I would tell President Obama if I could tell him something. Uh, I don't think it's reducible to anything short enough to tell the president. Uh, I'd, I don't think that I know anything that's reducible to a last word. That's, our, our people like to trade in that kind of stuff, but it's stuff. It, it really doesn't amount to very much. What really interests me is the possibility that we humans can make sense. <laughs> this is an issue, this is a, a, a formal issue of the greatest urgency and gravity, what are the conditions within which we human beings uh, can make sense? Within what limits are our minds effective? Now we've, I've been griping about this to uh, some of my friends lately. Uh, we've had two generations of college bred people now who have really been indoctrinated with the idea that every big problem has a big solution. And I just don't believe it. The big problems we have now are going to be solved, if they ever are solved, by hundreds of people accepting local responsibilities for small problems. They're never going to get famous. They're never going to get tenure for this. <laughs> but this is the way it has to work. We're not really very smart, we humans. 
And the idea that somebody could come up with a big solution to a big problem is always dangerous. It always comes up with this, the, simple, the simple solution. People who make simple solutions always make trouble. <laughs> and they're always surprised by the trouble they make. So, you know, to hell with the last words. <laughs> Let's try to make one sentence that's rightly uh, positioned within a manageable context so that we can utter it to somebody else and they'll understand it. And that we'd be then on the way to defining a job of work that we could actually do. I think... Well, so this last one is not a question it's a statement and it looks like a good one to bring this to a close on and then I have something to give to Wendell and this is I'll just read it Wendell thank you for your companionship and direction for the companionship and direction you have provided for me since I read the unsettling of America when it first came out there may be no true blood between us, but we are kin. All right. Then how'd you settle for two last words? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>